Hello, Blenders, and welcome, welcome to episode number 238 of Real Blend, a podcast that will cut off a finger if you say one more word to this. <laughs> On this week's show, it's a big week at the theaters. We're talking about Glass Onion, uh, The Fablemans by an up-and-comer named Steven Spielberg, and then Devotion... Mm. With director J.D. Dillard on the show. It's Thanksgiving weekend. It's when everybody's going back to the movie theaters. And so we have a ton of great titles to talk about and some really exciting interviews. By the time you guys are listening to this one, hopefully you caught Ryan Johnson, uh, the director of Glass Onion. He was our bonus episode on Wednesday and a uh, return guest, the Real Blend podcast. Always great to have Ryan on. Um, I'm Sean O'Connell, the managing editor at Cinema Blend. I'm joined, as always, by Kevin McCarthy of Fox 5 in Washington, D.C. Hello, Kev. How are you? Jonathan, Gabriel, Jacob. And also, yeah, it's fun, interesting. We had Ryan's first appearance was the first Knives Out. So we've had him back to back. So if you go, go back and like listen, to, it's, it's an interesting thing. And then this particular film we're going to dive into later on the show today. But uh, it's awesome. We awesome. will only have him for Knives Out movies moving That's forward. It. I'm fine yeah. with that. Yeah, yeah, if he thinks yeah. anything else, we're going to pass. But uh, <laughs> uh, and Jake Hamilton from Fox 32 in Chicago. I didn't realize it was Black Day, guys. Mm. You didn't get the memo? Now, uh, you know, Sean, you mentioned Ryan Johnson being a return guest. Um, we should get another return guest on the show, maybe in the coming weeks. <laughs> now, oh, that's, right. hashtag if it happens. Yeah, let's let's not tempt fate with that. My friend. I'm yeah. feeling cocky, man. I'm feeling <laughs> so, cocky. Uh, no, 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 that's that's where we get that's that's where it gets slippery. We got to be careful. Uh, that's, that, there, there are a lot of factors in play for that one. Um, that one is a lot of factors. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because the, the circumstances that in order to pull that off are um, it's going to make for a good story on Real Blend one day. 100 percent. Yes. Yeah. Hopefully and, after and it it's, a, it's a big name. Yeah. We'll just tell you that. <laughs> Oh, it's a big one. And by it's that, Kevin one. means it's long. It's like it's a lot of letters. <laughs> it's a really long <laughs> oh, Now people are going to think Tarantino's coming no, back. No, no, no. It's not Tarantino. It's not Tarantino. Wait, no, what, what actor has a really long name? Like, uh, I'm trying to think of other people. But, all right. I don't know. Okay. Arnold, we'll keep, Arnold we'll Schwarzenegger. Arnold yeah, yeah, Schwarzenegger yeah. is pretty long. It's not Schwarzenegger, though. <laughs> it's not Schwarzenegger. <laughs> all right. If you're watching us on YouTube, hello. Thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate you joining us. Hit subscribe. Turn on your notifications. You'll be alerted the moment of the new episode drops on Friday mornings. Um, we're available every place you get your audio podcast needs met. And if you would like to subscribe to Real Blend Premium, go to the description of wherever you are listening to the show right now. It'll get you a bonus episode on Mondays. It will get you a newsletter. Um from me and it will get you an ad free version of the show. All right. We have a lot of stuff that we have to get to, including, oh, I want to plug the Ryan Johnson interview. I mentioned it earlier. Uh, Ryan Johnson joined the show. This is a bonus episode, not behind the premium wall. It's just a something you guys can go and listen to is spoiler free. So uh, if you want to listen to it before going to see Glass Onion, uh, you can do that. And um, highly, highly informative. Yes, Jacob. I was, I was going to say, don't you think the person I'm most excited to hear this interview is Kevin because he tells a breaking <laughs> bad story that's going to blow oh, your freaking mind. I so uh, I, just just for clarification. So the story that Jake's referring to, I saw Sean tweet this out and I haven't had a chance to read the article yet, um, but it's a breaking bad story. It sounds like it's about Ozzy Mendez, which is a yeah, great episode he is. directed because um, Ryan did the fly and Ozzy Mendez, I believe. Right. Aren't those his two episodes? I, could I be thought wrong. he had a third one. He definitely did the fly. OK. And, and I which thought is, he had a third one. And the fly is like one of those controversial ones. I love the fly, but people were like, oh, it, nothing happened. That was the whole point of it. it I, was I like, love it as a too. separate entity. Like, yeah. I, don't, I don't not within the like whenever we were watching it week for week. I didn't like it in the context of Breaking Bad, but like plugged out almost like I would love I would pay money if they performed that on stage on Broadway. Yeah. Well, and, and real cool. quick, I know we had to move on, but uh, I haven't seen the article yet, but from what it sounded like from the headline was about like getting a shot in the light. Um, and it's funny because there's another great story. I, he didn't direct crawl space, but it's my, it's one of my favorite episodes, probably my favorite episode in the whole series. Mm -hmm. And that has a similar shot or similar moment, I guess, where uh, Gus has Brian Cranston's character uh, in a, you know, his head's covered by that, whatever this like, I don't know. Oh what yeah. You call that. yeah. 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 Like and, a sack. And, and if you, if you watch the shot, the sun goes in and out of the clouds like three times and it's a oneer, and it's impossible that it would actually work that way in, in verse of time. So they actually have this massive wide shot back and they sped it up. But because you're so far back, you can't even tell that the people are moving faster wow. than they would in normal life. That way they could get the sun to go in and out of the clouds. So this story intrigues me because any major shot on that show that I've read about 
were like uh, things that I thought were like monumental and brilliant were like up against the clock. Wow. Oh, dude. That. So yeah. it gives me so much anxiety. I will give you a hint about this real fast, real fast. I know um, it is a pivotal moment uh, in in Breaking Bad as a as a totality. Right. Something to do with Dean uh, Dean's character. I'm not going to give away that. OK. OK. And and all I'll say is they had, they had packed up the, the gear uh, mm. and we're and we're leaving before Ryan Johnson realized, oh, shit. We didn't get coverage for for this moment, and they raced to set up uh, because the shadow was coming across. Wow! And would have messed up the shot. And when, when and you find out what shot it is, you're it's going to blow your mind. And it shot on thirty five. So Michael Slovis, one of the major DPs in that show, they were shooting film on that show. Yeah. So I mean that that even makes it even more insane because they it's had fantastic. to shoot it on film. So go listen yeah. to the Ryan Johnson interview. You guys will love it. But in the meantime, Excited. we have another interview for you guys to listen to right now. Uh, there's a film coming out uh, this weekend and it's called Devotion and it's been making the film festival rounds and it is um, I, I feel a little bit bad for Devotion in this sense. It is the second sort of naval aviator story to come out um, after With Glenn the, beh Powell. the behemoth With that was Top Gun Maverick. And yeah, yeah. And Glenn Powell is behind it. And uh, Jake, I don't know if you guys it did if you when you did the junk, I got a chance to like speak with Glenn Powell and I had to throw a top gun question his yeah. way essentially and you could just see him kind of like sh you know sigh a little bit like because he's been working on this project for years for five years which, which if you've ever yeah, asked yeah. an actor a question and seen like the life get sucked out of their body because they've been out, like we, well, we've all experienced that and oftentimes it's questions that you have no choice but to ask sure. there's no more disheartening feeling than just seeing like as the you're shoulders. in the middle of asking the question you can right. just tell the actor just is getting ready to go into like, well, <laughs> OK, here's here's the answer to the question. Everyone, you know, yeah. it's funny you bring that up because so uh, last week I did. a uh, Actually, I, I wasn't involved in the Ryan Johnson interview because I had to go to a red carpet in D.C. for devotion. And so I Glenn Powell and Jonathan Majors were there. And when Glenn Powell showed up, like that was the, the thing in the back of my mind that I kept thinking, I was like, I got to bring up Top Gun. Yeah. But how do I do it? First of all, he's probably already been on. 50, 60, mm -hmm. 70 interviews by this point. So when he walked up, thankfully he recognized me. And the the in was, dude, the last time we were saw each other, we were on a aircraft carrier in San Diego. And yeah. now we're in the US Navy Memorial in DC. And then he took it. And then, yeah, man, this has been the year of the Navy pilot for me. And like went on this oh, amazing beautiful. answer about like five years of devotion. I shot Top Gun two years ago. I mean, he like, again, to his credit, completely just like gave it to me like as a as it was new and natural and but i also think the combination of me seeing him and him sure. remembering us from the carpet helpful but also like see, i'm saving that line for the next time i see tom cruise like oh <laughs> right. dude the last time we saw each other was on an aircraft carrier <laughs> remember that yeah but yeah. like honestly like as i said that to, to, to glenn powell i mean as those words came out of my mouth dude the, the last time we saw each other we were on the USS Midway in San Diego, and now we're at the U.S. Navy Memorial. And he goes, oh, yeah, we got to we got we got to stop meeting in these places. It's crazy. <laughs> like, I mean, it is insane what we do. But anyways, it is so. bizarre. Well, the director of Devotion is J.D. Dillard, and he's a terrific interview. Mm -hmm. uh, cool really, guy. Really knows this stuff about um, naval aviation. Loved our show, too. He told me to say he said he had a great time on our podcast when I saw that's him. so cool. That's so cool. We yeah. had a great conversation and you guys he's like, I love right happy, now. sad, confused. <laughs> <laughs> he's like i love that bbc show you're on what oh we love happy sack diffuse as well <laughs> we do we do but he's on real blend right now yeah. jd dillard speaking about devotion absolutely i'm sean o'connell from the real blend podcast hi jd how are you doing we meet again my friend Yes, we do. And I'm going to try my best to ask you questions that you haven't received <laughs> over an entire weekend of press <laughs> for this movie. Um, all right. So Real Blend, I have two other hosts who are normally with me. They're both en route to Los Angeles currently right now. So okay. I'm going to uh, fly solo on this one. No pun intended. Yeah. Um, yesterday, you uh, mentioned something in our TV interview that I wanted to follow up on and just the structure of the TV slot doesn't allow for it. Uh, you were talking about securing the planes that you needed to complete the shoot and how there were only, I believe you said, 12 of them yep. that exist and you used six. Is yep. that right? Uh, that, I um, think that's the math. Yeah. What is the insurance situation like when you take half of the existing fleet? You know, Sean, there are some conversations you like to be privy to and then others you intentionally hide from. Because, uh, you know, there's only so much anxiety uh, any of us can hold on our own. 
right. Um, right, right. But look, I mean, it's uh, uh, it is absolutely an orchestra to to requires an orchestra to get all of that stuff together. Um, because yes, there's insurance on planes that cost, you know, probably two to seven million dollars per. Um, you know, there are the mechanic teams around each of these planes that have to be on set because they know the intimate quirks of each of these old warbirds. There's getting them mm. to a location, you know, there's getting them getting them all painted the same color, you know, from the same squadron. You know, so they're all they're all of these people and that and we haven't even shot anything yet. That that's just to like you know, get them to base camp, basically. Sure. Um, yeah. So it's, uh, you know, Kevin LaRosa, who, who sort of was our, uh, you know, he was our aerial coordinator. He was the, the, the pilot flying, you know, all of our sort of, you know, camera vehicles in the air. Um, it was sort of his job to, to help put all of these pieces together. The one thing that is great about, you know, privately owned airplanes is that the people that own them want to see them do cool stuff. Um, so, you know, <laughs> we had a lot of very generous people, you know, offer their support in uh, getting these, uh, getting these warbirds back on the screen. And what kind of conversations did you have in terms of just where you can mount your cameras and where you specifically wanted to mount your cameras to capture specific angles? Um, that was a really fun and quite trial and error -y conversation. You know, mm -hmm. it, it would start with, okay. What do we want to see? And that'd be Eric and I talking, um, Eric Messerschmidt, um, our, our DP, talking about like, oh, this would be nice and that would be cool. And OK, what about over here? And obviously you're sort of you're looking at the script and the moments that you need to serve in the story. Um, and then what you have to kind of do is you start you start kind of demoing them by putting them on the planes, which is its own very strange process where the sort of metal paneling that covers the plane we would remove that metal panel, machine a new panel that also has a mount on it and fix it back to the aircraft. And then right. you, you have to, you know, go to Steve Hinton, one of our um, one of our pilots and have him fly the plane with that equipment on, because what, what he needs to start getting accustomed to is how differently the plane flies with all of these new odd places of drag. <laughs> You know, um, and there there were certain mounts where he got down on the ground and was like, I know it's a cool shot, but we can't put the camera there because the, 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 <laughs> the plane is too squirrely, you know, so you, you have to kind of inch into this. And then it's like, OK, well, we can do mounts A, C and F at the same time. We can't do B with C because that makes it too. Wild. So it, it's it's a lot of it's a lot of trial and error, um, ultimately winding up with, you know, quite a Frankenstein of a of an aircraft with a lot of things mounted on it. But that's fascinating. The audience doesn't think about the amount of detail that goes into pulling off, you know, what could be a, 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 a 30 second shot. There is a movie in and of itself about just trying to get these planes in the air. <laughs> so, yeah, it is certainly uh, certainly a journey. Are you doing all of this from the ground or, or at any point did you get up in a plane? So um, here's the funny thing about that. They let you up in prep. Um, okay. But the second you're like two weeks out, uh, right. they don't let you go in the air anymore because um, okay. if the director were to perish in an unfortunate accident, um, that sure. is quite a liability. But the funny thing is that the second you wrap, they're like, whatever, man, do whatever you want to do. <laughs> we can finish the movie on our own if we absolutely had to. <laughs> so uh, uh, the day after we the day after we wrapped, I got a ride um, uh, in a P-51 Mustang to kind of celebrate. Um, um, and uh, yeah, production was like, go with God. Um, hope to see you. Hope to see you back here. But go with God. So. Was this like um, barrel rolls or just speed or what was it? My friend, uh, we uh, we definitely took the P-51, uh, you know, to its limit um, to sort of see what that old warbird could do. Granted, not a, not a plane that appears in the film, um, but uh, 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 after watching aviation for seven months, a, a hell of a lot of fun to get in the backseat <laughs> of a plane like that and get to get to experience it myself. I can imagine. Um, there's a great conversation between uh, Glenn and Jonathan's characters um, about learning at the academy versus actually flying, you know, and, and experiencing it. And so I want to flip it and turn that to filmmaking. And I just want to get your opinion on 
film school, you know, versus being on set and learning as you go? You know, my my experience has oddly been half and half. Um, I went to film school for two years uh, and then I started working in what would have been my soft, uh, my junior year. Um, and look, uh, one thing I've realized as I've begun to have more and more friends who are also filmmakers is that none of our paths have been the same. Um, hmm. um, and there there is oddly no commonality to how anybody is doing this job. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think ultimately what is the most important is, you know, what you have access to, you know, um, and, you know, if moving to a big film city is, is really not in the cards for you, but the local college has, you know, equipment and professors and, and, and the means to give you, you know, that access, um, that makes mm -hmm. sense for that person, you know, if, if you can't get scholarship money or any way to pay for school and you know you you live in atlanta or you know savannah or new york or you know la it's like well m maybe just starting to work makes sense for you mm -hmm. i i think the 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 thing that we all get really obsessed about you know is the technicality of the craft but at the end of the day i think what is what is significantly more important is learning what you want to say and how you want to mm -hmm. say it, um, because in there is like the staying power, you know, um, and the, one of the great side effects, but then there's another side of the coin. And I think the democratization of film technology, you know, the you can shoot a movie on your iPhone. Um, sure. It, it, it's that there's so much more stuff, you know, um, and I mean, I remember just being not that much younger, but like how big a deal it was if you were like Vimeo staff pick because it was like, you know, it was a destination and there weren't that, but it's like, sure. There are so many incredible shorts every day, <laughs> like falling onto these websites. I mean, sure. Just shooting something technically sound is, is, is not the calling card it used to be. And, and, and now it's actually, you know, using your voice to do it. So then I'm curious, what's the takeaway from from this movie that you specifically learned uh, about how you want to convey the type of storytelling you want to do? Yeah, I mean, look, d devotion is the sort of new standard for me and just what I want the process to feel like, you know, um, to have time to litigate the script, to have time to really prep with the actors, you know, um, to have, you know, I mean, I, I've been blessed on all movies to have incredible collaborators um, um, and, you know, devotion certainly, uh, uh, you know, is 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 the same there. But I, I know that I I'll say this. I kind of want to go to genre next, but make that genre thing the way that we made devotion, you know, to find something oh, that is really emotionally rich and. Um, complicated, uh, but just, you know, actually starts to bring the worlds of my first two movies back. Um, but, you know, hopefully with sort of the, 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 the scope of, of this film. Um, but, you know, look, you learn, you learn, you learn how to do your job better on, on every movie. And, and the weird thing about directing always is, you know, and you read the books and you read the interviews and, you know, you take a blocking class here and there, but, there's this kind of paradox where you will always be the person who has made the least amount of movies on your own set. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and what I, what I am learning more so is that that is exactly why you need to rely on your collaborators, you know, right. um, cause Eric Messerschmidt has been on more sets than me. When Thomas has been on phenomenally more sets than me, you know, sure. Jonathan, Glenn, like that's just the nature of the job. Like I have to make the thing and I sit with it for years and then I'm like, hey, remember me? Like, you know, I directed devotion. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, no, it's not that it's like that at all. But, you know, you, you stick with it longer. So your your reps game, you know, uh, operates at a much lower level than everybody else. But that's exactly why, you know, you, you need to work with people you trust. All right. I want to ask a fun one. Um, you get to do something that not a lot of people get to do, which is cast uh, Elizabeth Taylor. <laughs> what was that process like and what were you looking for? You know, uh, well, I'll, I'll start with what I was looking for. You know, 
given the reality that we were trying to build in devotion, I, I didn't want that moment to like pop you out so severely, you know, sure. but it still is one of the few moments that sort of, it, 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 it embodies the sort of larger than life feeling uh, of like the, the adventure that they're on. Um, yeah. But there are kind of like, you know, two paths. There's, there's trying to capture, you know, the character and mannerism of, of Liz. And then there is trying to capture sort of, you know, the essence and awe of Liz, you know, um, and there's, there's certainly a lot of overlap, but just in terms of what I was looking for, I wanted to kind of capture the, the, the awe of Liz first, you know, and I'd worked with Sorinda on uh, an episode of the Twilight Zone um, mm -hmm. and just had such a blast working with her. And she's such she's such a great, kind and generous actor. Um, and as I started running the, the, the just the list and how we're going to do this, it was actually my fiance who was like, wouldn't Sorinda make a great Liz Taylor? And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know what? Absolutely. Because she she has that kind of movie star quality um, and it, it kind of like arrests you in the film. You're like, sure. You know, and, and, it, and I, I think casting someone who has that energy makes you kind of double take. It makes you like, wait, oh my, is this, hap is this happening? Is this happening right now? Um, right. <laughs> right. Um, and, and Sorinda just did that with, with such grace without ever making it feel like caricature. And that that's when, when the movie is already so grounded and hopefully so emotionally real, you don't want anyone to enter the film with caricature. Um, sure. So that, that balance is really important, but it's uh, it's why Sorinda was the right one for the job. Something so striking about the guys showing up in their dress whites too, you know, to that scene, it just, all of it is, all of it pops like that. Well, it's like, you know, even though it's a true story, you want that like, you know, stranger than fiction feeling of Forrest Gump or, or, or just the sort of like the magic that you get in a movie like Big Fish. Like there are there's those, the, I think those films just kind of capture that, you know, kind of like kinetic awe of being on the road, <laughs> being away from home. And, and, and there, there's a, there's a magic there um, that was really exciting, but you know, you want to do all of that without like breaking the movie. Um, and Sorrento sure. was kind of the key to, to getting to do that. One of the elements, too, that holds the film together is your score, uh, which I, I love. And I would just love to hear your um, inspiration for how you chose what type of score you were going with for this movie. Um, thank you for being the first person today to ask about Shonda Dancy's incredible work in the movie. Um, uh, I mean, look, the, the, the point of view on the score was very tied to what the point of view of the, the, the general aesthetic was the, of the film was, which was how do we collide you know, a sort of reverence for the classics with modernity, you know, um, and the, the score is a great way to express and kind of exercise that because, you know, you, you want the sort of very thematically led, you know, big orchestral feeling, but then you want to find these ways to, you know, sneak synth in, to sneak in modern sounds, to, to add modern mm -hmm. texture, you know, and when I met Shonda, um, that was sort of the first thing that we connected over was like, well, how do, how do we make 1950 feel like today? You know? Mm -hmm. Um, and we, we shared some songs and she played me some things and, you know, zooming out Shonda herself just had such an emotional connection to the story. Um, um, and, you know, is, is a black woman herself and saw a lot of herself in Daisy and the sort of family connection um, and, and nucleus of the film. Um, so from the beginning, it just felt like we were speaking the same language. Um, and, you know, one thing that I said early on was like, I, this is, I, I want this to be a movie where the theme is something you can hum, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and then when, when you, when there's a, that excitement, when you hear it in a place in the movie where you weren't expecting it, you know, I, I and I think that's like, you know, that's like the Star Wars thing, <laughs> you know, yeah, when, yeah. when you sure. when you hear the the theme deconstructed and you're like, oh, it, it, it signals to the body that you're like, this is this is important. This is big. 
Um, yeah. And I really wanted to do that. Really wanted Jesse and Daisy to have a theme. Really wanted Tom and Jesse to have a theme. And, and really wanted the, the, the notion of devotion to have a theme. Um, and we sort of articulate those at the, 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 you know, the sort of complimentary moments in the movie. Um, but yeah, I just like, look, I blast Shonda score in the car. Like I, I, uh, I, I'm, I'm so grateful and, 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 and pleased with it. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's sort of like as big and as hopeful as I, as I hoped it could be. Jay, did you play music on set? Uh, yeah, um, I do. Uh, but, uh, but I'm also very sensitive to where the mood of the set needs to be. Um, okay. um, and I'm also really careful to not play music when I know everybody needs to be calibrating in their own way. Um, okay. um, because one song is not going to apply to everybody. Sure. You know? Right. Um, um, but there, but music is certainly a way that I communicate. Um, you know, there were so much of my text chain with Jonathan throughout this process was a song here, a song there. And sometimes you wouldn't even say anything and just be like, blop. And like, you know, knowing look like, you know what this means. Um, yeah, 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 <laughs> because yeah, yeah. so much of the, so much of the process I think is it's trying not to like over speak the magic. Um, okay. um, you know, because I think sometimes when you associate too much language to it, uh, it, it, it actually starts to disintegrate. So mm -hmm. one thing that was helpful for, for us was, yeah, kind of communicating through song. And then honestly, and this is something I did with the cast at large, um, uh, is send poetry, uh, because I think poetry, interestingly, wow. <laughs> by nature, uh, at least short form po poetry is really about eliciting a, a, a feeling like expeditiously <laughs> um, and expediently, yeah. you know? Yeah. So um, sure. Mary Oliver, one of my favorite poets, um, coincidentally has a book called Devotions. Um, wow. And it's a, uh, uh, it's a collection of a bunch of her poetry, but there was so much Mary Oliver actually floating across the set. And it's just like, okay, hey, that scene tomorrow, just Mary Oliver poem, song. It's like, great. And, and you show up and you're like, right. And everybody's like, right. And then you, you could kind of get to work where I could stand up there and be like, look, today is really about, I could say all of that, but, um, yeah. but actually yeah. I'd rather everybody feel it and be operating from a place of knowing what it felt like, you know? What a beautiful shorthand. That's incredible. That's also really great. hugely recommend Mary Oliver devotions. Like you got to buy yourself a copy. OK, um, what is the scene that you spent more time on in the editing room than anticipated? Ooh. Um, I would say it is that the, the, there are there are two scenes kind of back to back where um, Jesse finds out that Tom wrote him kind of accidentally wrote him up in a report uh, in the mission report. Oh, right. Um, yes. And then there's the scene that comes after that where Tom brings the signed signatures of support for Jesse. Um, the first scene is a one -er, so there was not much mm -hmm. to do that. It's a slow kind of, you know, the Kennedy brothers facing each other, slow push in. Um, and we actually kind of use that picture as a reference point for that. Um, oh, wow. Um, but the second scene is actually a scene with coverage. And it, it, wasn't, it wasn't that I was looking for the scene because we did litigate these things so intensely in prep and then ultimately on set that the cut, the cut never really changed that drastically. You know, it really was always about just tightening and sharpening, but that was a scene where walking the line of, are we saying too much? Are we saying too little? And, mm -hmm. and even though it wasn't, it was never rebroken in editorial, it was never restructured mm -hmm. in editorial. It was mm -hmm. this constant push and pull of a, like a, 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 the lift of a look, you know, the addition of a sigh, the, 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 the removal of a, you know, a disengagement, you know, to just find that level of frustration between the two of them, because it, it, it sort of is the scene where they are both most paramountly frustrated at the other, you know, Jesse's like, you don't understand how to help me. And Tom is like, I'm doing everything to help you. <laughs> And, yeah. and it's getting, right. it's getting completely lost in translation, 
you know? Right. So threading that was both difficult on set, but then in editorial, you just realize the power of a look, you know, the, the, the power of a micro moment and wanting to not overstay, but also not move too quick. You know, um, I would say that that scene kind of took the most to come together uh, and just finding, you know, what would be just right. This will be something that um, people listening won't get until they are able to see the film. But the stocking cap payoff is spectacular. Oh. <laughs> just, hey, man, set up payoff. Sometimes it just feels it feels really good, man. <laughs> it feels really good because I'd completely forgotten about it. Yeah. <laughs> until it came back around again. You let enough time pass. Yeah. And I was like, oh, that's that's excellent. <laughs> Chekhov's hat, man. Chekhov's hat. <laughs> um, whose review of this? movie uh meant the most to you or means the most to you um the families mm-hmm. um you know obviously they're watching it with a very specific lens and 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 uh, a, a, a lens that has overlap with general audience but you know is is very different in in so many ways um because look, I mean, you make a film, you want people to enjoy the film uh, and, and you want them to be moved and you want them to laugh. And if there's space to cry, you want them to cry and you, you want all those pieces. Um, but in a story where I, as a filmmaker, am a guest in the legacy of their family, you know, um, sure. um, it would it w- would just be the worst to 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 show it to them and to feel like we have not represented Jesse and Tom well. Um, and look, you know, we all know, like, it's it's hard to to force a true story into a movie, <laughs> you mm. know, um, yeah. and, and as great as an opportunity as it is to share, uh, you know, a sort of unheard of story with the masses, the, 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 the process of forcing someone's life into two and a half hours is right. so unnatural. <laughs> You know, right, right. Um, and you have to find the delineation between making still continue to make the movie that you want to make, yep. you know, versus the movie that, you know, is going to make them happy. Yeah, thousand percent. And and look, they're 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 by all accounts, Tom and Jesse are great people, you know, mm. but you have to also find these ways to create conflict without undermining the the the, the legacy of these men, you know, um, um and that's a balance and, and you try it on and okay, that feels too much. And okay, we're going to adjust it here. Um, but I, but I think what, what, what ends up being the most useful is, you know, not treat them like deities, but treat them like people and put yourself in their shoes and, and just off the bat, just try to start with honesty um, and tell the story through that lens. You, You'll find the conflict because conflict in our own lives is often not that big, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. um, and and, um, you know, all, all feelings are valid um, and sort of building the movie inside out. Uh, I think both service the film, but it also kind of protected the legacy because, you know, we, we weren't trying to artificially make this giant drama between them. But we we're actually trying to tell a very nuanced story of mutual understanding and just that as an experience is is plenty of drama. Um, but I think, yeah, the, the, the review, the, the, the review, the feedback, the buy in that was most meaningful to me was, yeah, from the Browns and from the Hutners. J.D., they're giving me the wrap, but I hope I was able to hit you with a couple of things you hadn't heard. I have heard none weekend. of those things today or this weekend. So uh, uh, 10 for 10. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> hey, fantastic. Delightful. Well, we're so happy to have you on. And, and I'm really, really, I, th- I love the movie and I can't wait for people to see it. So, uh, thanks so much, man. Such a pleasure. I'll talk soon. Thank you so much to J.D. Dillard for joining the show. Uh, make sure you guys check out Devotion. Uh, it's it's uh, you know, we make the comparisons to Top Gun at the beginning of the movie, but it's not. It's a totally different story. Uh, it's set during the Korean War and it gets into these uh, what I thought was a really interesting angle into the story, which is soldiers who enlisted during World War Two and then didn't get a chance to fight. 
Like by the mm. time that they completed their training, they the the battle was over, and they were kind of left in a limbo of what are they going to do. And they eventually get into some um, some aerial combat, some reasons for them to get up in the air. We're going to review Devotion uh, in its entirety later on in the show, so make sure you guys tune in for our reaction to the movie. Um, about that. Uh, hey, listen, we like interviews on this show, so we're going to throw you to another one. Uh, we had Patrick Corcoran, who is the vice president uh, and chief communications officer of NATO, which, as you guys know, is the National Association of Theater Owners. They've been very supportive of this show, and they know that we are huge proponents of the theatrical going experience. And they ran a, su a survey that uh, Patrick wanted to come on and talk to us about, which was um, speaking to different people who come to the theaters uh, who might start coming for non-traditional programming, which means, you know, not the new movies that are coming to theaters, but things like uh, sporting events or live concerts. Um, and then they got into some stuff about like cooking demonstrations, which I found to be really fascinating. And it's a bit of the struggle of what theaters are facing in terms of um, luring people back in still at this point. And, and one of the things that Patrick talks about, as you'll see, is just the lack of movies. You know, they used to have a, a glut of films that were coming out at any given time. Um, and now it seems like they have less and less of these films to promote. And maybe the pipeline will grow back up. But until then, they're coming up with different ways to sort of fill that void. And so uh, we wanted to have Patrick come on the show and talk a little bit about this. So uh, without further ado, and of course, thank you to NATO uh, for continuing to sponsor this show and to throw their support behind Real Blend. Uh, and for that reason, we wanted to have Patrick Corcoran, the vice president and chief communications officer for NATO on the show to talk about this very interesting survey. Um, all right, Patrick, thank you so much for joining us on the Real Blend podcast. Uh, just for starters, can you let our audience know uh, what you do and uh, at NATO and what some of your goals are in the uh, in the immediate term? Yeah, uh, I'm the vice president and chief communications officer for NATO. So I handle all of our communications to the press, to you know, when we're lobbying, we we shape our messaging, you know, about anything that we talk about publicly and, and internally is I have a hand in sort of framing how that that's uh, put out to the public. And our, our, our biggest goals right now are uh, sort of getting the movie industry uh, back to full health. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, what we've seen is that, you know, people are absolutely willing and excited about coming back to movie theaters. We see it in all the, the results that we've had this really spectacular summer. Uh, what we don't have are enough movies right now. Uh, you know, if you look at wide releases, we have about 62% uh, of the number that we normally have. That's like movies that are released on 2,000 screens or more. Mm -hmm. And uh, But interestingly, the box office from those movies is about 65% of what 2019 was. Uh, okay. so, so with, you know, uh, we're, we're tracking slightly ahead in terms of the the audience interest in that, and we're also seeing that uh, there's a, a higher interest in uh, you know sort of those non wide release movies. We we need more of both of them basically. Mm -hmm. We need more of everything, which is why this study is so interesting because it sort of points in a direction for uh, where we can get some of that uh, either movie content or non traditional content. Absolutely. So let me catch people up. That's why we have you on the show, because uh, the Cinema, Cinema Foundation and the um, the research firm, The Quorum, uh, put together this study where they demonstrated high interest amongst people that they spoke to uh, to see more non-traditional programming coming to movie theaters. And I was curious what you thought was the biggest takeaway uh, from the results of that study. The biggest takeaway is that people love going to the movies and they and it's not central to them what that thing is right mm. so it's like obviously the thing that is our our biggest uh offering to moviegoers is movies uh but for a lot of people they want to see more things there's an opportunity to get more people more often in the movie theater and really interestingly people who have not gone to movie theaters very much or at all over a considerable amount of time not just during the pandemic uh, would be interested in coming back to the movie theater. They like that experience. They're just not interested in mainstream movies. So mm -hmm. the idea of non-traditional content or, you know, non-mainstream or non-current movies showing up in the uh, in, in the movie theaters is, is an attraction for them. Sure. And of course, like retro programming has been something that movie theaters have played around with often. But then there were three sort of non-traditional experiences uh, right. That were highlighted by the by the survey, and they were um, special television episodes, which I found really interesting. Uh, live concerts, which I know that like live concerts have sort of been programmed in theaters uh, over time, and then cooking experiences. And I was just hoping you could maybe fill in our audience about 
what's some of the experience that you guys have had previously that have might have suggested that these types of non-traditional programming might work? Right. Well, you know, there have been things like like Game of Thrones, you know, the finale or the the beginning of a season has been a, a really uh, popular item. And, and some of those things have been sort of free and you're just charging for the, the, the concessions. Uh, but there's a lot out there and there's so much that uh, people are really, really into this. You know, everybody talks about fandoms and there's there's niche marketing and niche programming for a lot of these things. Some of them are really widely popular. And the key is to identify which one of those are have really dedicated fan bases and and mm -hmm. and want to share that experience that they have with other fans of, of what's going on. I mean, right, right this weekend, we've got something called uh, The Chosen, which is uh, a, a faith-based uh, series, mm -hmm. and it's uh, starting its third season. And the tracking for it is about 6 to $8 million for the weekend, which is crazy. You know? And so there's a lot of opportunities like that. And if, if you have a lot of that, it helps fill in the blank spots that we've got. And once we've got a full slate of movies back, it's going to help add to that right so it's, it's the only additive it's not taking away from anything what's been uh, fascinating is is to see um television series like use and or as an example you know these are filmmakers who are making television shows as if they were mini movies and you almost lament the fact that you don't get the opportunity to see them see some of them on the big on the big screen right that, that's absolutely right and and you know there this goes back actually really to the the early days of movie theaters if you think about it with with serialized um uh, uh, programming, you know, the, what Star Wars is based on it was the old Saturday morning serials where you'd get yeah. one episode of, of, you know, along with the cartoons and the main feature, you'd get a, a serial 20 minutes, 30 minutes of, of uh, a particular story that's going on. And the next week that start, you know, you, you've got another one. And so that kind of thing can continue to like grow audiences and pull them back in week after week. Mm -hmm. uh, that's something that has to be built on. Obviously, you know, it's uh, the idea of, of going out to the movie theater is kind of, there's a block of time that you want to, <laughs> you know, set off there because, you know, you're, you're spending time to to get to the movie theater and, and getting ready and everything else. So you want to spend a couple of hours there, which is why this idea of, you know, doing the a couple of concluding episodes of a series or or the beginning episodes of a, of a new season of a series is really attractive. And and with the live concerts, you know, obviously we've had a lot of that uh, one off events. Uh, it's been done through, you know, companies that specialize in that. But there's a lot more interest in that i think we can go wider with some of this um mm -hmm. you know particularly with with when you've got uh cities where the the tour is sold out or cities where the tour is not actually going to show up that's just mm -hmm. a huge opportunity to to bring in an audience and to to bring in more money to the producers of, the, of those concerts uh live cooking is is interesting that sort of took us by surprise yeah uh, uh, i'm curious how that even work, how that would work yeah, uh, there there can be things where you can have sort of cooking demonstrations, uh, you know, mobile kitchens and things that are set up the same way. You know, you do it on a TV show. It's like they're they're there on the set with a, a mobile kitchen and doing particular things. But there's also the opportunity with with in theater dining. You know, such a big deal right now. You can tie sure. this thing into what's happening back in that kitchen there uh you can put it up on the screen and you can demonstrate how something's happening so it's you can get a really you know a 40 foot tall way of making an omelet you know it's, it's for people <laughs> like that stuff uh you know the the great british bake-off and uh, there's things like that that people just really really love and sort of uh get attached to and want to see more of and uh you know there's there's also uh you know, obviously, you know, in theater appearances by by directors and and actors and things like that, and those are really really popular. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we we had a, a discussion at the, at the DGA and we were talking about that, and and a couple of the directors we were talking with said, w "Would people really be interested in that?" And I was like, "That's just remarkably non egotistical." Out there. It was like, "Yes, yes, they'd be very very interested <laughs> in that." Uh, you know, the opportunity <laughs> to have that, and, and and you can do it live in some places, and you can stream it and broadcast it out to to other theaters uh, on the same night. So there, there's a lot of opportunities to to just sort of fill this need that people have for entertainment and, and interesting things. Absolutely. Um, because one of the um, responses to the survey, too, which, you know, it's not getting away from movies altogether, but it's this idea of repertory titles. And right. there's a, a slew of them from the 70s and 80s that there's a generation of filmmakers or film goers now that never got to see something like Jaws on the big screen. So do you think right. we're going to continue to see some of those titles coming back? 
I think we will. I think, you know, the weekend that we did National Cinema Day, we had Jaws in, in a 3D remaster and it did did really, really well. Uh, mm-hmm. There's been a lot of things that have been tied into sort of, you know, it's gone on for a long time, like the DVD release of a particular movie or the 50th anniversary of a particular movie. So you sort of can tie in the marketing to it. And those are tend to be one off events. Uh, but you look at things like the new Beverly, you know, Quentin Tarantino's uh, movie theater where they do mm-hmm. thematic programming and it's a it's their movies run for just one or two nights and there's mm-hmm. two a couple movies and they're they're tied together in an interesting way and that's kind of the way i really fell in love with movie going when uh, i was in college we had you know repertory theaters and they were playing a crazy variety of of, of movies that just that you know you may not have seen it may have only been five years old right you know so there right. a lot of foreign right. films and you can take you can take uh you know if and if you've got those two movies offered and you're, you're you can go and see both of them and you're you're really sure you want to see one but maybe you'll see that other one there's a there's real interest in it and we saw it across demographics uh that people are intrigued by that um you know, there, there are movies that, uh, you know, I remember from, you know, my favorite movie in particular was Dr. Strangelove. And I had only seen it on television dozens of times, you know, as a kid. And when I finally got the chance to see it on the big screen, it was amazing. I mean, the whole thing about, the you know, the war room and just how well shot that is, how beautiful that is in this right. ridiculous comedy. Uh and and the the effect that that has, and you know, you think about the the scene where uh, you know Peter Sellers is wrestling with his arm and, and trying to do that, and everybody's standing around him, and something you don't really see <laughs> on TV is the guy who plays the Russian ambassador is completely losing it. He's absolutely about to bust a gut, <laughs> yeah. and just really, t- and you see that on screen, and, and Stanley Kubrick left that in. It's, it's you know, no, the scene is so great. I don't care that somebody's about to break, right? Um, right. But but there's there's that opportunity to to really reintroduce things to people it's an opportunity and this is the i think the biggest element of this this is an opportunity for studios to make money on on their library films that right now are getting a few watches it's nice that it's in their streaming library but how many mm-hmm. people are actually watching those things uh so that, that opportunity to both leverage stuff they've already spent money on right. bring new attention to it and by bringing it into movie theaters, it builds up the the awareness of it, and people become aware that it's there on the streaming service as well, even if they don't come to the movie theater. So there's 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 benefits and and ways for everybody to 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 win from this. And and, and partly the the goal of the Cinema Foundation is to both uncover stuff like this. You know, the the kind of data that we've come up with from this study is really really interesting, and it can be acted on. Right. But yeah. ultimately, ultimately, it's going to be up to producers and distributors and it's going to be up to movie theaters to get together and explore ways to to build audiences and make money off of this. And, you know, we can help facilitate that through the foundation, something that's a little tricky for NATO as a trade association. Sure. Is sort of the whole point, right, of the Cinema Foundation is that we can bring groups that are not just movie theaters together and we can look into things that benefit everybody and we think that there's some real benefits from from just the strong interest of people in going to movie theaters and also in things that they're not getting from movie theaters right now so we want to put those things together absolutely hey taylor swift uh put your concert uh your upcoming concert we we will only pay you know charge like half of the seventy eight thousand dollars you have to spend exactly yeah (laughs) well these are fascinating initiatives uh and i know we're definitely going to be covering them here on real blend because we are 100 percent behind the theatrical experience uh, and it doesn't have to mean movies like you're saying the survey is proving that just going back to the movie theaters to experience um some other exciting content uh, is is landing on people's radars and i can't wait to see where it goes from here. Patrick, thank you so much for joining the show. Oh. We really appreciate your time and uh, we hope to have you back on soon. Yeah, absolutely. My pleasure. Thank you so much to Patrick for coming on the show and discussing that survey in depth. And of course, thank you to NATO uh, for continuing to sponsor the Roblin podcast. Uh, and you know that if you listen to the show, we are going to be sending you to the theaters often to go see things like Glass Onion and The Fablemans and all the fun movies that we're going to be talking about in our next segment. Uh, So thank you again to NATO for sponsoring the show. So let's get into this week in movies, because this is uh, traditionally a huge weekend at the box office, especially here in the States, uh, where it's Thanksgiving weekend and families 
will flock out to see uh, some of the new exciting things that are coming. And sometimes you just want to get uh, off the couch and out of the house. And um, especially, you know, like uh, parents with kids who their kids are off from school and want to go see something uh, unique and different. And so to that end, Kev, you saw Strange World, which is this Disney movie that personally I feel has been marketed poorly. Like I have no idea what it even is. Um, and we didn't. Oh, we all right. To be fair, we did get a screening in our market, but it was on a Saturday morning at like a theater that was the <laughs> furthest away from me. So I did not go to go see it. But you went and saw it. So what did you think of it? Yeah. So, I mean, this is Jake Gyllenhaal. It's Dennis Quaid. Uh, it's a it's a family of explorers, essentially. And, you know, it's a father son story. So in the beginning of the film, uh, you know, J J Jake Gyllenhaal's character you know, he's a kid, doesn't want to be exactly like his dad, has different ambitions. So uh, Dennis Quaid's character, uh, they think he dies in the beginning of the film. This is not a spoiler. This is just the story. Classic the Disney. Right. And so <laughs> so basically the, the son goes on to do amazing things in his life and, and ends up uh, being thrust back into a story where he reconnects with his father. And he now has his own son. So it's three generations of these families and explorers and kind of those dramatic things that you're dealing with. Animation wise, it's fantastic. Um, I don't know that there was anything in this movie that that was new or exciting in my mind. It was just a kind of a enjoyable father son dynamic about our legacies and our generations and what we want to do with our lives and pushing through. So those thematics worked. Um, but I, it's one of those ones where as much as I love the theatrical experience, I think it's a gorgeous film on screen it would be perfectly suitable for like a Disney plus viewing with your family, well, which um, is really funny because like in, to undercut the theatrical viewing experience for this, like Bob Chapik, who's the guy who just lost his job at Disney. He essentially came out and said like strange world will be on Disney plus by Christmas. So don't worry about said it. said that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he's not wrong. <laughs> right. I mean, right. I mean in, in the sense of like, I, I don't, I mean, listen, I think that people will go to the theaters to see it like with younger kids and, you know, they're and Gyllenhaal's great in it. Dennis Quaid's great in it. I mean, the characters, yeah. it's well made. It's not yeah. a it's I mean, it's it's interesting. I just didn't I just, you know, out of all the things I've been seeing recently, like from the whale to uh, Banshees of Inisherin, like like the, and I know these are very different genres and films, but we've seen really high level good animation done well. This sure. is good. It's just I just didn't think it was mind blowing. So yeah. it's it's fine. It's fine. Okay. Sounds good. Um, yeah. So here's a movie that Kevin and I saw. Uh, mm. and, and Jake, you did not get a chance to see this yet, right? You're muted. Jake has checked out. I did not. I'm dying completely. to see it. Uh, no, you're not. Daenerys was barking. Uh, no, I am. I am dying <laughs> to see it. So this is uh, Bones and All. And it's from the director of Call Me By Your Name. And it, uh, it reteams him with uh, Timothy Chalamet. Uh, and Mark Rylance is in the film as well, too. Mm. And then, um, Gabe, can you look up the name of the of the actress? Taylor who's in it Russell. Taylor Russell. So she was in Damn. Waves, um, which I adored. Um, she's a sister who took over the back half of that story. And then she was also in the two uh, Escape Room films. And uh, and so essentially um, she's a cannibal. And this isn't a spoiler um, at all. You learn this in the first f five minutes of the film, essentially. Um, and it starts off a little bit with like how her father is struggling to deal with the fact that his daughter is a cannibal. Um, and then she goes out into the world. She kind of leaves her father. The father basically says, I can't help you anymore. And she goes out wandering, becomes a bit of a road movie. Um, and she keeps running into other cannibals <laughs> as Eaters. if there's just like, yeah, as if there's just cannibals kind of wandering around <laughs> America and they find a way to so there's this whole bit it's almost like a vampire story-esque because they talk about how they can smell each other and they know when other eaters are around um and like how are they gonna uh, yeah a little bit but not not like Twilight <laughs> in the fact that when you get to the cannibalism bits of this movie um it is gory just gory um and so no matter how much we try to prepare you for this, it's going to be really difficult. It's going to be really difficult. Um, but then and then on the flip side, it's supposed to be kind of a romance. And I've seen a lot of the critics react to the the romance angle between uh, Taylor and Timothy. And personally, my reaction to this is I didn't find the romance angle interesting enough and I didn't find the the cannibal aspect interesting enough it's almost like to me the movie went half of the way in each of those instances and so i wasn't really invested in 
either angle of the story. Um, and and it's almost like I became numb to the cannibalism part of it after a while. Um, and I just wanted to invest in their relationship. And maybe it's the writing or maybe it was like a lack of chemistry between the two of them. But I didn't buy into that. Kev, did either of those aspects of the movie strike you? Yeah, I mean, I have a very interesting take on this film because I think it's extremely well made. I think the performances are amazing. I think the love story is great. I was involved in all of that. Um, but it is it, it is there is a point in this film where I just said to myself, like, who am I sending to see this? Mm. And, and and it's not like at the end of the day, I think the juxtaposition to me it, that's interesting and why I think it's a well made and I, I would say it's a good movie because of what it does is on top of all the graphic violence and the gore and the eating and the disturbing nature of that you have a hard time looking away at the love story i did at least and i cared for taylor russell and chalamet's characters i thought they were interesting together um but there are scenes in this film that i wish i could unsee and i will mm. never see this movie ever again in my life i do not want to watch it. you can't pay me to watch it again but at the same time i recognize that it's good filmmaking it's well shot it's well performed it's well edited it's well written um but at the end of the day, I just on a personal level don't want to sit through things like that. I mean, the older yeah. I get. Um, also, this one in particular, though, I don't think people understand how disgusting this movie is. <laughs> like it yeah. like you're talking about like a film that I am shocked got an R rating. I don't know how they got an R rating. Um, it seems like a film that would never be made by a major studio. It does not seem like I, I can't believe Especially in the beginning, when you first start seeing some of the cannibal stuff, even the smallest scene yeah. is disturbing. Um, but there are sequences in this film that I will are going to be in my head probably the rest of my life, um, especially Mark Rylance. You're selling it, tidies. baby. No, no, no. I mean, listen, I'm dying. No. Honestly, this this no, honestly no. sounds great to me. Yeah, yeah. No. Jake, honestly, Jake, after you see it, go out and buy some whitey tidies, just like Mark Rylance wears in, in this one particular scene. And and, and, and you could just pay homage to him in, in, in your apartment. In, enjoy. enjoy. Okay, le I legit. This, this isn't meant to be a smart ass question. So um, my mom's coming into town and we take her to see she it. and I both love horror films and, and she's got a pretty good stomach for like brutal, gory horror films. Is it not a thing like it does? Does the not, love of horror film cross over? No, not a horror not, movie. It, it's not a horror movie. It's, it's not, not a horror it's movie. Not that it's, way. Yeah, it's just disgusting. Like, it's, but, just, but, it's just a disturbing film. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, just ask yourself this. Do you want to sit down in the movie theater with your mom and watch people eat each other? That's, yeah. that's really that. If you if that answer to that question is yes. Then happy then Thanksgiving. You have, then you have yeah. some issues. It's not, <laughs> no, I mean, there, listen, Jake, there the are plenty of, of other movies you could, you could watch with your like, mom. Like there are so many great horror films out there that, could, you know, this is I don't consider this horror. This is just. I don't know what this is. It's a psychological horror in a way. Um, it's never scary. It's never meant to be scary. I looked it's away. Just, five it's just meant times. to be grotesque. I don't look it's, away it's in movies that much. I looked away five times. I remember I and. Yeah, and it's the thing. It's like I'm sitting here talking to get the cannibalism stuff up and going. First minutes. fifteen minutes. That's what I'm talking about. All right, I'm in. Not even wow. five. You right? the sleepover. The sleepover. Really eagerly excited about. Well, I, yeah, honestly, you I, guys are selling I, it. I really I do want to see. This. If I was on the other side of this conversation and hadn't seen it, yeah. this would make me want to see it. <laughs> Just because <laughs> I would be curious. But I will tell you now, this is not that type of exaggeration. We are just being brutally honest that it is not a pleasant experience. And I want to make I it abundantly it. clear. Yeah. I'm Kevin filming. says he likes it. I can't recommend it on any level. Like, I'm not I, sending anyone to go see this. I'm and not. that's the thing is I, I don't. Uh, if somebody genuinely said to me, Kevin, should I go watch this movie? I'd probably say no. But I would also with an asterisk say it's actually really well done. It's just something I would not wish upon. I like Chalamet to... a lot in it. He's great in it. it... I thought he was really good. Rylance Chalamet's is just a great actor. Scary. Chalamet's a great actor. R Rylance, it might be the Rylance's performance is shocking. I hated him. I, <laughs> oh, I hated thought he was great in this movie. He's hated good him. in the movie, but you don't like good. Rylance. No, he's really bizarre in this movie. He's poorly written. He's you're he's, poorly written. You'll see. I you'll actually see. listen. It, 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 this is a very weird movie because I. I would give it a good review. It's mm. just that I don't. I'm just. I I can't. 
um, tell someone to go see this and then and think right. in my conscience they're sitting there for two hours saying Kevin recommended this. Yeah. And then they're watching they will hate those you. scenes. Uh, so David Gordon Green it. shout out, by the way. He's in the yeah, movie. He has a cameo, which is very bizarre. <laughs> Who does? David, David Gordon, Gordon Green. Green. David Gordon Green shows up in it. Yes. It's so random. It's really, it's really bizarre. Uh, Jake, take us away on Glass Onion, uh, a Knives Out mystery reaction, uh, knowing that we had Ryan Johnson on the show. And we're going to do a deeper review uh, of this when it comes around to streaming, which is going to be in about a month, which, again, I feel really bad for the people who are going to have to avoid spoilers for another month. Right. Yeah. But this movie's yeah. going to as soon as it's going to hit, people are going to want to talk about it. I have a hot take. I actually, and again, no spoilers. I don't think spoiling this would ruin the movie. Oh, I'd be furious. Oh, no, meaning, I'd be furious. No, the point I'm making is I don't think knowing what information would ever be considered a spoiler. I don't know. The, the I, twist I, is I so disagree good. with it. I died. To me, like the the chance to try to figure it out myself and yeah. try to you, stay even ahead if of I it. Told, even if someone said X, Y, Z I would never ever want to take away no, I'm the not twist though of no, no, I'm not saying we would, but I'm saying I think that it really is so it exciting. Be, the first time you get to one of the reveals, there are several reveals yeah, in this right. movie. There's multiple. Is, that's what I'm saying. It's not yeah, just that's one what I'm saying. Thing. Yeah, I think that that would that would definitely, but okay, not be exciting in <laughs> vague people. terms. If someone were to say that out loud right now, which we're not going to. Yeah, it's it would not take away from the brilliance it of how things unravel. I think it would, I don't, I don't, it would take no, away I, I, the I first time because the first and the second are two completely different experiences. I, I, that I, you're gonna have. I think you could argue that no spoiler <laughs> takes away the brilliance of whatever it is, but it takes away the experience of experience. Yeah. This yeah. has to be so annoying for people who haven't seen it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. let's not even. T- I don't even want to dance around it. Just right, just right, give right, our right. reactions. We're going to we're going to talk yes. deeper whenever it comes to streaming. But we have an interview for you guys to listen to, which is great and spoiler free. Um, but go Jake, see it in the theater if you can. But liked yeah. it, loved it, hated it. Where are you uh, at? I absolutely loved it. I I enjoyed, loved the just the experience of it. Um, mm-hmm. which is a, a sort of sort of sort of something I I don't feel like I have felt a lot this year. Just sitting down and just losing myself in the characters in the moment and just yeah, eight mile in, yeah, mom right. spaghetti. Um, and it just. <laughs> Kind of like trying to trying to like see if I could outsmart it, which I never could. It was always two steps ahead of me every time I thought I had something figured out. It, it, it definitely. I mean, it also there was um, a lot of misdirection in the trailer, which I thought was was really fantastic. But I, I thought it was really great. I had a ton of fun. Honestly, if Ryan Johnson wants to make these for the rest of his career, like I'm down. Like if he if he came back and was like, dude, I've got ideas for I want to do 10 of these. I'd be like, cool, dude, I'm in like it's it's honestly Probably the most ex- like in in terms of like my excitement for a series or a franchise, it's got to be top five for me right now. In terms of mm-hmm. like like you've knocked it out of the park, you're batting a thousand. So whenever the third one comes along, I'm back in it. You know, I'm told I'm totally in. So I am I am in hook, line, and sinker for the Knives Out mysteries. I think they're fantastic. We don't know what this would be, but I have a random pitch, and because it's Netflix, so they've only bought two and three. Would yeah. you be interested in? A Netflix series of like hour long mysteries, but like well, he gets to funny. put together uh, Janelle, this like Monet brought that up in my interview because I asked um, what other murder mystery movies would they love to see Benoit Blanc dropped into to see how long it would take him to solve. And she said, like I she goes, my like my reaction is to say something like a murder she wrote and to see Benoit Blanc solve like mur- hour long murder mysteries, which would be mm-hmm. really fun. And but I don't think that you could get. It wouldn't be that same experience. You in wouldn't an have hour. the cast. You wouldn't yeah. have eight different stacked yeah. casts. Yeah. Yeah. I do different. find it, it interesting kinda... that there's a quote from Ryan Johnson about like, I don't want to botch this, but I thought this was really fascinating about like how Benoit Blanc is like the constant, but he's never the protagonist. Yes. Right. 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 Um, in the yeah. stories, because like it's, it, it's like a perfectly balanced role that is just there at the right time when it needs to be, yeah. but it's, it's not the star. Yeah. Even right. though it, it feels like he's the constant here it's interesting and especially like in both of the films it's so much fun to watch the other characters react to him Mm -hmm. um because in both instances 
they're surprised by his presence. Yeah. You know, uh, I because I rewatch Knives Out going into it and I forgot that, like, during the interrogation scene where they're interviewing the different members of the family, he's just in the back by the piano and he's hitting the one key <laughs> yeah, every yeah. time people say something. And then they're finally like, who is this guy? Why is he here? Kind of thing. And um, there's always a bit of a mystery surrounding why he's even there. Like, sometimes he's not even 100 percent sure of why he's there. So I found that to be great. Um for people who were worried, this was my biggest concern going into it, that it would just be a rehash of the first movie that that Ryan Johnson would be tasked with. Oh, the first one was really successful. I got to figure out a way to do it again. And I don't necessarily have the most original idea in the world. So I'm just going to kind of play the beats that worked for the first one. And that is not the case here at all. I'm stunned at how different uh, from Knives Out it is and yet still rewarding in its own deal. Um. I think Jake and I differ on this one. I like this one more than Knives Out. Uh, I think it's a tighter story. uh, And I think that there are some more twists in this one uh, that I just didn't see coming at all. Um, and so but they're both I was, they're I'm both. leaning. I'm, I mean, it's at this point, it's it's splitting hairs because both of them are incredible. There Terrific. are moments where like and I, th- I think a big part of it is and, and you've gotten this. Uh, if you saw Knives Out, you know that the first and second viewings are two completely different experiences once you sort sure. of know. And I think more so this one, the second viewing experience, which I have not had, right. is going to be a whole new thing. And I feel like once I'm able to have that and see much more of like the layered genius of what I'm assuming is there that, that yeah. I just wasn't there to I couldn't pick up on. Um, I have a feeling I might be leaning more toward um, well, because I, I had to pull some clips of Knives Out for my interviews uh to to air on fox and in pulling knives out clips kind of made me think ah glass onion might be better than these clips that i'm pulling gotcha well i think i think the the sequel is a lot more complicated and layered like an onion literally like no pun intended on that but that's really kind of what they're dealing with here and when you find out what glass onion means it's it's kind of a it is brilliant in in a in a way um i think for me, it's funny. I I I don't even I I have a hard time comparing them because they're so different. Um, like for me, like and I remember Knives Out one hitting me harder on the first viewing, but then I went back and watched it and it was great. This one I haven't seen the second time yet. Um, but one thing I love about this film is and and I don't I think this is interesting. I saw some criticisms on this. The film's opening, like the opening 10, 15 minutes, is very jarring. It's very different. Um, but it's all misdirect. And like, that's the thing about like when you're watching these films is that like when you're, when you're going to an opening of a movie like this, you're expecting knives out again. And it, and it is just an introduction of multiple characters and things are happening that you're not even noticing yet that then you will go back and think about a lot. And I think that's one thing I found interesting about it is it just started off on such, such a note that I had absolutely no idea where it was going. Um, it just didn't feel like the first one. So I was like, right. oh, where, what's, what's going on? Where is this going? Um, performance Who's your favorite wise, new character? Who's your favorite new character? Ooh, good I mean, I, Janelle Monet. I mean, Janelle Monet's performance in this film is outstanding. And, and, and I, I just have to say that I think she deserves an Academy Award nomination for this performance. I think she's brilliant. Um, I also thought that obviously Daniel Craig is great. Edward Norton's great. Batista's great. Hudson's great. Han's great. Um, uh, right, Madeline, one. pick one. <laughs> I mean, my favorite in the new one. It's so honestly, to be really honest good. with you, it's a hard you question. You said Monet. You said Monet. Monet is probably good, the one. It, if I look back on the film and you were to say, Kevin, who gave the, who gave the most memorable and best performance in the movie? I would say Janelle Monae. Just Jakey. and, and yeah, I really think she did. I don't think there's any line delivery this year that is better than Daniel Craig going oh, Halle Berry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know why that makes me laugh and so. Much. I'm telling you, there are jokes in this film, and I'm not even going to say what they are, even though they wouldn't be spoilers. But there's jokes about two actors' names that come up within a within a couple bits in the film that I think are some of the funniest, most random writing I've ever seen. And like one of these names is attached to a scene that Sean and I have discussed a lot about ripping things. Yeah, yeah. I won't say anything else, but. It is genuinely just it's it's a late it's a it's a razor sharp script. It's like it's almost like like you're watching and going, this is perfect. Yeah. Like note for note for note for note. Every every scene matters. Every movement matters. Even even like like the littlest details of a scene matter, even when you're not expecting it. 
because that's the beauty of the whodunit, right? Is when they go back and they unravel it all for you. Of course. And you go, yes. how did I miss all of that? So yeah. it's amazing. I think it's on par with the first one. I think it's phenomenal. Um, beautiful writing direction. And it's just awesome. Great characters. Yeah. All right. So uh, J.D. Dillard was on the show earlier and he has a movie coming out called Devotion. A bit of an Oscar play. Uh, Serious story set in the past. I I mean, I think Sony thinks it's an Oscar play. I think Sony would like it to be an Oscar play. No, what? What's that face for? What? (laughs) It's not an Oscar play. You didn't it's not. like this movie as much as I did. I like it's it not. A, it doesn't matter whether I liked it or not. It's not an. It's not an Oscar play. It's just not. No, it's just admit no, no, you're not devoted to devotion, Jake. Come on. But I'm, you, you know what I'm. You know what I am devoted for winning the Oscar prediction contest every <laughs> year. My point being, you don't think Sony thought it was an Oscar play? I mean, they if it's coming out in do. November, they cleared. Someone thought it was. An, I mean, any any movie coming out in November, they think it's. it's I think an they Oscar realized play. it wasn't, and I haven't seen it, but I think they realized it wasn't after Top Gun hit. Maybe. I mean, Top Gun definitely takes a little wind out of the sails and it's unfortunate because if the movie had its own run, maybe we'd be viewing it differently. Um, uh, that, that is a great point. Like how I haven't seen Devotion, but we all are seeing Devotion under the guise of Top Gun. I mean, under yeah. the under the, the mindset of having seen Top Gun. So when you see Glenn Powell again on screen again, I haven't seen Devotion. But when you see him on screen again and there's planes involved, there's no way your mind doesn't think about it. It's not sure. possible. But so I do wonder how devotion would play had Top Gun not come out this year. Well, and Good it is question. a different story. If we can convince people to <clears throat> go into it, accepting that it's a completely different story and that Jonathan Majors um, and Glenn Powell, oh, I think, do, actor. I think they do a terrific job of playing the characters that they're given. And it, if anything, the movie's set in the 1950s. Um, It does get into some of the racial complications that Jonathan Major's character faces uh, by being a naval aviator. And it's almost like the 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 Navy and the national media at the time want to make a bigger deal about him being uh, one of the first African-American pilots to participate in this flight program. And he doesn't want to be viewed through that lens. He just wants to be viewed as an additional fighter. Um, He runs into probably an exaggerated amount of um, of pushback from the people in his ranks um, when I think that, you know, the aviator pilot, uh, aviation pilots probably res- would have respected each other more. And for a Hollywood point of view, they have to sort of drum up the drama. Um, it loses itself a little bit when it wanders into some of the um, adventures that the, the soldiers get into in Europe. Uh, and I mentioned earlier that question about casting Elizabeth Taylor and um you know, that's one of the sidebars that the movie sort of goes on. And it's a way to sort of build up the characters. But I think the movie works best when it is doing the the aerial fight sequences, the dog fights. And uh, James the effects Miller, look amazing. It look it, it looks fantastic from the they're trailers. Really? They're good. They're very impressive. I like them a lot. Um, it tries to tell the story of, you know, some of the people that w- that you leave back home when you go out to fight in war. It's cliched stuff uh, and it's stuff that we've seen before, but I thought it was all handled really well. I liked this. Jake, you were not as into this one as I am for what reasons? Well, it's so funny because I almost feel like we would give it the same. Like we're like everything you're saying about it. I feel like I'm saying about it, but my words just have much more of a negative connotation than yours do. Like it's it's fine. It's not a bad movie. It's a very well made version of a movie you've seen 10,000 times before. And once I started realizing that it was clicking these boxes that I've seen, even though, yes, it is representing a period of history in a war that is, is, you know, it's still told in such a way that it's just sort of like, okay, like there's there's that. Okay. Yep. There's that. Yep. There's that again. And I just like all the beautiful shots and all the cool aerial footage can't make up for the fact that it's pretty color within the line storytelling. Mm -hmm. Um, It just it it never hit to the point where like I did not know this story, but based on like the direction, I was like, I can guarantee you that X, Y and Z are going to happen. And X, Y and Z happened. Um, Mm -hmm. It's there's nothing wrong with it, but there's nothing special about it either, other than the fact that it looks pretty visually stunning. I mean, everyone is doing their best work. I mean, like Jonathan Majors Jonathan is great. Majors Glenn is pa- great. Yeah, Glenn He's Powell really is great. great. Um, it's it's not it's not the Oscar movie that they, if, if 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 they were hoping for 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 that, it ain't it. It ain't uh-huh. it. Um, All right, so Devotion's not in the Best Picture race necessarily, uh, the way that things are shaking out. Uh, I saw a tweet today from Jacqueline Coley, who's over at Rotten Tomatoes and does a lot of oscar tracking and she essentially says that in listening to the 
uh, AMPAS members that she has spoken to. And she's on the ground in Los Angeles. She's at all of these different screenings and attending the different parties. And she says the three horse race for the Oscars is currently uh, Elvis, Top Gun Maverick, and this next movie that we're discussing, which is Steven Spielberg's The Fablemans. Those are the three that she hears about the most. I uh, think Elvis is going to have a much bigger play at the Oscars than than we think it is. 100%. Well, according to her, the AMPAS members love it. They, they, they love it. Uh, and they're all in on... Um, who's the kid? Who's Austin Butler. Butler. Austin Butler. They're all in on him. They they love the movie. They they love Hanks. And um, yeah. God, can you, if Hanks gets... If, I don't think Hanks gets into supporting actor, but... Me, he may. Why not? Stranger Things I, happened. I, I, yeah, but the, honestly, it, I actually loved Hanks in the movie. Me too. But to me, that look that seems like the kind of performance that gets a Razzie nomination. Oh, I don't know. Do the, the, the Razzies that, that, they, the thing? That, well, they, they love picking out one. The, the Razzies are stupid. They are incredibly yes. stupid, full but they stop. love. Yes, full, full stop. stop. But yeah. they we should love never talk nominating about them on this yeah, show. You're right. <laughs> unless we, but, but they unless love in this context, picking yeah. performances like that. Sure. Very showy like balls to the wall you know swinging for the fences kind of performances yeah, yeah, yeah. that do or do not you know um make contact it's clickbait those it awards are ridiculous. clickbait also yeah. like like razzies are, fall into the same category as like it's, it's something that you click on just like it's the same thing as someone doing a worst of the year list yeah oh I don't yeah under, i don't do that I don't, either I, I don't just don't get it it's just so mean-spirited yeah, yeah. yeah. But anyway, this is a distraction to lead us into the conversation of the uh, the third movie that was mentioned, Steven Spielberg's uh, The Fablemans. Um, and I'm going to go first. I got a chance to see it early. I did not get a chance to go out to the junket. The boys got a chance to go out and participate and interview the cast. Uh, and Kev got Mr. Spielberg. This movie, I saw it in Toronto. And Sean, it, can you please tell the, the story about uh, you, Michelle, and my picture with Steven Spielberg? <laughs> all right it requires a little bit of setup um jake and kevin went out to the fableman's junket and jake was under the auspices that uh he was not going to get steven spielberg but he was still going in hoping that maybe there would be some room spielberg was doing a very limited amount of time kevin was lucky enough to get one of the slots uh jake was on left on the outside Jake got closer than I did to remind you all. I didn't even get invited to the junket. I was so far behind. Um, but Jake went on the off chance. Uh, Jake didn't get him, uh, but he did get a picture with Steven Spielberg as Spielberg was leaving and he was going down the hallway and stopped. I guess. Did he stop to talk because I saw Tara got a picture and did he sort of stop and do a couple of pictures? He or? would have had to blown. He would have had to like, like, like plow through me to get past me like I, he, was, Brown, he, he wasn't getting, he wasn't getting past me i took well, that photo and, and, and kevin yeah, was yeah, yeah. i always say kevin was like ready to go he was yes. in like because you know in those oh, yeah. situations if you've ever been in those situations before um you've got seconds there you don't have time to to like fiddle with your phone you've got to be like on it anyway yeah yeah and um so there was a lot of discussion in the text thread leading up to it of just like, are these guys going to get him? Who's going to get him? I, I would make jokes at my own expense of just like, oh, I'm not even in the running, blah, blah, blah. And then Michelle was going through social media and she saw the picture of Jake and, and Steven Spielberg. And she goes, oh, my God, look at this amazing picture of Jake and Steven Spielberg, which uh, you would think that a friend would immediately be like, isn't that great? Isn't that so great for Jake? And I immediately shouted out, well, he didn't get him. <laughs> in <the> interview. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> we didn't, he didn't get him. He just got, he just got the photo. <laughs> 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 Terrible. I mean, horrible wow, friend. That's that. When, when Sean first told me that, that is the, <laughs> honestly, like, yeah. well, I was gonna, I don't, I don't want to say it was worth not getting him to get that story because it wasn't, but it, 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 it was, a, it was a good companion piece to yeah. not, we're behind the scenes. We're very competitive about <laughs> the opportunities that we get and don't get amongst ourselves and amongst other people. At, at your funeral, when they're lowering the casket into the ground, <laughs> I'm going to take a framed copy of that photo and just place it on top of the casket. He never I got him. Never got him. I'm going to hear that whisper as your casket is lowered. You never got him. <laughs> Spielberg's going to show up. I never <laughs> spoke to you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's got dark fast. All right. So the Fablemans, um, <clears throat> this is a masterpiece. The movie's a masterpiece. Yeah. Um, but I'm going to, I'm going to couch that ever so slightly in saying that it's a flawed masterpiece 
but I think that the flaws um, are things that I really, really love about it. Um, I recognize them as issues in the movie. And, and if some people go check this movie out and it doesn't connect for them, um, I could probably single out the reasons why it, it, it can feel a little long. It does sort of detour into some other stories um, as it's playing out. And you start to wonder like, which direction are we going in this and how come we're going down this route? But it's because it's so personal to Steven Spielberg. And it's because it is encapsulating moments of his life that he definitely wants to explore. Um, there's a lot of stuff about um, the relationship that he has with his mother, who's played by Michelle Williams, who is phenomenal. Um, just a knockout performance um, because it's a complicated performance because she has some form of mental illness. I'm not 100 percent sure what it is. Um, I don't think it's ever made clear in the movie what it is, but she's a. Uh, there's a dividing line that they talk about a lot in the movie is the create the creativity, the creative mind and the scientific mind. And Paul Dano, the uh, uh, Steven Spielberg's father in the movie or the Fableman's father in the movie is the scientific minded person. And she's the creative sort of hard to pin down uh, artsy and encouraging uh, of him when he gets into his filmmaking. Uh, and it's extremely autobiographical. And the way that it's shot is magnificent. Uh, Janusz is just on another level uh, with this. When you when it gets into a lot of stuff about the filmmaking aspects of a young Steven Spielberg trying to figure out how to mount the things that he sees in his imagination and stage these great movies, you know, out in the desert with his with his high school friends, like all of that stuff is amazing. Um, but then it goes into some really complicated areas. It goes into this, the these bullying aspects that he faced when he was in high school. Um, it gets into his parents divorce. Um, and it's a lot of material. It's a lot of material to try to tackle in this in this runtime. It's a two hour, 40 minute movie, I guess. Um, I was never bored by it. I did recognize some places where if it wasn't so deeply personal to him, I might have pulled back just from a narrative perspective. There's some weird aspects. Like at one point, Michelle Williams uh, brings home a monkey because she wanted a pet monkey <laughs> and she names it after the guy who she left behind, who's played by Seth Rogen. Like there's a lot to explore. You know, there are aspects of it, I think, that you could have stopped on and said, why don't we unpack some of this a little bit? Because there's a lot going on here and then you're kind of bouncing off to the next thing. Um, but then you would have had a 10 part miniseries probably. And you could have had a 10 part miniseries for this. I feel like there's that uh, amount of emotion. Um, but it's again, masterfully shot. Uh, the cast is incredible. I appreciated the insights into Spielberg. Um, I think his love for cinema is, is dripping over every single frame it has uh, the greatest ending to potentially a movie, definitely a Steven Spielberg movie. Uh, it's so incredible. I, om I almost hate referencing it because I want you to experience it the way that it plays. Um, but it's incredible. It it's incredible. It's one of the best movies I've seen this year. I cannot wait to see it again. I haven't had a chance to see it on a second time. And if you love Steven Spielberg, if you appreciate Steven Spielberg in any way, shape or form, uh, I think you're going to get so much out of it. So. Um, am I alone on this island, Jakey? Uh, you are not. And I think the reason I know that I love this movie as much as I do is that if it weren't about Spielberg, I would still mm. love it. What this movie has to say about how our life influences our work, our art, whatever it is, because I, I think the work that we do is our own version of art. I'm not saying that like we're producing jaws or raiders but i think that we're proud in the work that we do and i think that our lives influence the work that we do and i mm -hmm. think on the flip side of that the work that we do influences our lives i think we should be so lucky is to, to kind of put out sort of work that we consider to be art in some form or fashion and this movie is such a beautiful study of how impossible it is to separate those two uh, judd hirsch has that great line where he says, you know, your your heart and your your art, it rips you in two because so often our lives are intertwined. And the movie really studies how our what we love and the work that we do, how it has the power to impact people. There is there's a moment in the film that I won't ruin, but it's the moment where Stephen, a young Stephen, um, truly understands the power that his filmmaking has on other people. Mm -hmm. And how it has the power to portray people in a certain way, even if they don't want to be portrayed that way. Mm -hmm. And you can you see the wheels turning 
when he's almost like that, almost like a moment, a superhero film where like he let loose his powers for the first time and goes, oh, crap, what 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 just happened? All the so that that alone made for a beautiful, powerful, poignant film. The fact that it is about my favorite filmmaker of all time, the fact Mm -hmm. that it in turn gave me a whole new perspective on so many of his films, particularly his early work. I mean, I, I dare you to watch the Fablemans and then not go look at E.T. or Close Encounters differently. Movies that very much had to do with uh, broken families and the impact of broken families on children, you know, early in his career. I mean, you can just see like, oh, my God, like that. Those are the films made by the kid from the Fablemans. It's it's just it's there. Like it's clearly right there. Um, beautifully done. I mean, beautifully told performances all around technical standpoint. I mean, a, a great screenplay by Tony Kushner and Spielberg. Um, it's ju- I, I just I, I adore this movie to pieces. It's just just a beautiful, beautiful piece of work. Um, it's a love letter to art. I, I I feel like we're starting to say that expression a lot for movies lately. Like, oh, it's a love letter to film. But like if anyone gets to make a love letter to film, it's Steven Spielberg. And Kev, you hated this for some reason. Well, I don't <laughs> well he hates Spielberg. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I um I liken this to why I love Hugo so much. Um I just think that That's interesting. That's an interesting comparison. And, and cause Hugo's my favorite Scorsese film, and I and I recognize that he's made my made better, better films, obviously with Taxi Driver and Raging Bull and all those films. But Hugo is the one to me that hit me the hardest mm. um, because it was about filmmaking. Um, what's brilliant about the Fablemans, outside of the idea that that it's based around Spielberg's childhood and teenage years, was learning about this sense of control that he got by filming, by using a camera. Mm -hmm. Um, There's a a great section in the film in the beginning, which you see in the trailer a little bit about the train and why he keeps filming it. And his mother, Michelle Williams, basically says that he's trying to control the train crash. Um, And so later, as the film progresses, you realize that the camera is a soothing, cathartic tool for him to understand the hardships in life. and I mentioned this to you, got to you, Sean. I think there's a scene in this film, again, without going into so much detail, where a pivotal moment is happening within the household. Um, and this is not a spoiler, but his parents went through a divorce, and this is uh, this has all been apparent in his movies over the years. And James Lipton brilliantly brought this to Spielberg's attention when he told him that the that the aliens, the way they were communicating, was essentially Spielberg's parents mm-hmm. in. Uh, in Close Encounters, the because the 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 science and then the ma- the musical aspect Musicans, of it, yeah, mm-hmm. right, because they use music, right. So, <clears throat> what's fascinating about the earlier Spielberg stuff to me is that was all unknowingly cathartic. He wasn't; mm-hmm. it, it, it was dripping out of him, and he was working through it, but he didn't really probably know why. Which is why, in when you watch the Lipton interview. Like Spielberg is like, oh, yeah, wow, I never even thought about that. Like and like Lipton's like basically revealing to him one of the most personal antidotes of one of his movies that Spielberg never even put together, uh, at least based on the interview. And so there's a moment in this film where where so the film is generally shot 35 millimeter, 185 aspect ratio. And we're in the middle of a very dramatic moment. And young Sammy, uh, Gabriel's character, uh, we, we go into a different film stock before we even see Sammy holding a camera. And we know immediately, just based on the grain and the and the quality of the image that we have now entered Sammy's perspective from the perspective that we were just in in the movie. Mm. And now we are cathartically understanding this process of this dramatic moment through his eyes. Then you see him holding the camera. Then you see him filming it. And it's like. To me, that subtlety, that 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 shift in grain, that shift in film quality was so subconscious and so small and minimal that it was just supposed to hit you like that. And then you catch up with it in a second. Mm -hmm. Um, And to me, that is just. The true mark of an artist like that is so smart and so almost restraint like being held in that moment because it would have been really easy for Spielberg just to give him the camera and go right to the shot of him holding the camera so what the audience understands this is how he deals with the drama but what if we switch the film stock before you see him holding the camera 
you're so consciously going into his perspective, you know, even though you don't even know it yet. And that to me is the mark of one of the greatest filmmakers, if not the greatest director of all time. Um, that's a very technical note, but I mentioned that because that's such a minor aspect to the subtle subconscious aspects of what you're dealing with in this film. Like remember in West Side Story, how great that shot was with the shadows coming towards each other. Mm -hmm. We all thought it was a cool shot, but Spielberg, when he broke it down in the interview was, no, this is a thematic thing about equal elements. They're on the same right now. We just see the shadows and you don't know who's who. Mm -hmm. And like, he's thinking about every shot narratively, not. Mm -hmm. and, and I think we, we, as a, uh, as film fans, I love really cool shots. I love really cool editing. Um, I love, you know, but, but it needs to narratively work. Like when you watch Requiem for a Dream, Aronofsky's film, for example, the editing and style the of that film. The greatest director of all time. <laughs> right, but the editing and style of that film plays <laughs> into the narrative structure of what that movie's dealing with, the chaos of drugs and sure. spiraling out of control. But when you watch The Whale, for example, that's a very limited uh, film scope. It's more of just the intimacy and less style, right? And so because it's a narrative choice when you make those decisions. So when you watch the Fablemans, all these technicalities that I'm mentioning, these are all very minor things that you probably might not even notice. But your subconscious is so much more powerful than your conscious. So you are that's the power of immersion. When you're watching a Spielberg film, you are suspending your disbelief to a point where you are just taken into it. You might not even realize why you're feeling the way you are. Um, Outside of that, performance-wise, like Michelle Williams, Paul Dano, phenomenal. I thought Rogan was great. I was a little worried about Seth Rogen because he's so like the like Seth Rogen is so recognizable. He's in that so laugh, good, in Steve Jobs. But he's so great in this. And like yeah. I told him during the interview, I was like, "Dude, you it's also Steve Jobs. Like it, Seth Rogen's is." I feel like he has a harder time disappearing in roles just because he's like there's a loudness to him and there's mm -hmm. a there's a, a, a there's a personality that Rogen has but he's so great in this. He has one of my favorite scenes in the whole film outside of the Cinerama. Um, but you outside of that, like, I was I just think people, I think people shortchange him sometimes because oh, like, dude, he's a phenomenal actor. Like Seth, we were, uh, yeah. When we were doing our interview with him, um, Eric Eisenberg, who does, our, uh, did that junket for us, brought up like his, his um, ability to do improvisation and, yeah. you know, and, and so enhance smart. scenes that way. And he goes, well, yeah, I also did an Aaron Sorkin script, you know, and, <laughs> and you have to keep every every word of all that and hit all those beats. And you forget the masters that he's worked with. He's really had some right. amazing collaborators over the years. And like, you know, one of the things about this film that I love, again, it's really about the understanding of why that camera was so pivotal to him. He picked that camera up at a necessity, in my mm -hmm. opinion. Like he picked that camera up because he needed to understand what was going on in his life and he couldn't understand it any other way. Then through a camera and then there's like this beautiful moment where like Sammy, the character he's playing, the younger Spielberg, where he's just in bed anxious and he turns on his eight millimeter camera and just listens to it go mm. and it makes him go to sleep or, or calms him down. And you start to really understand that this guy, this filmmaker, Steve, Mr. Spielberg, was born out of a necessity to understand the world around him. And the only way he understood it was through making movies. Mm. And to me, that's what the film is about, is this idea of what films can do to help you understand your real life. And then working through therapeutic elements in your movies to understand what you went through and why you are the way you are. Mm -hmm. um, and the last shot of this film is one of the greatest shots I've ever seen. I still think Schindler's List, in my opinion, is, my, is the best ending he's ever done in a movie. But... This ending is amazing. And I will tell you this. I'm not going to tell you what it is. Once you finish the Fablemans, you'll know the scene we're referring to. There's a whole sequence towards the end. Look up the real story that Spielberg tells about that moment. There's mm -hmm. a uh, it's him and John Favreau and a couple other filmmakers. And Spielberg tells the story about what happens in that final scene. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And his recalling of that story is insane it's I, so well done um but I'm yeah i loved last it crusade I'm, i might go last crusade is his best final shot yeah i do love that that way but dude literally riding off into the distance see to me the the whole sequence in schindler's list when 
the actors are walking with the real family members. Yeah. 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 Through the through the memorial and they're and they're placing the flowers on each grave. Right. 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 I, I that's got to be one of the greatest. Uh, I don't know. It's one of the best, Pretty most amazing. impactful endings I've ever seen. I don't know the final shot of Schindler's List. I don't remember the final shot of that. Oh, movie. It's, it's the final shot it's, um, is when it's Liam Neeson in the distance on over Schindler's grave. But you see him from from far away. Right. Right. He places. I think he places the. I mean, please don't forget. I, I beg of you not to forget the last shot of the terminal. <laughs> What, what I, is it? I don't even know what the last shot of the terminal is. How do you guys host a movie podcast? <laughs> Does he leave the airport? It's, it's after he takes <laughs> he gets on the, the plane. It's after he takes the can of peanuts to the jazz club, <laughs> and he's leaving this, the jazz club. This doesn't happen. Oh, this <laughs> does happen. That's real. why he's in New York. It's not real. <laughs> he leaves JFK to go to the jazz club because of his dad. To talk Let to me. The, I'll mention one Victor more thing. Before, <laughs> before we move on, I'll mention one thing. Um, <laughs> We talk a lot on the show about film and digital, um, and I understand the arguments on each side, but there's nothing more magical than Spielberg making movies on film. The lighting that him and Kaminsky have gotten down, there is such a beauty and immersion to this world, and it goes back and forth between 35 and 16. I want to say all the 8 millimeter stuff had to be either shot or blown up to 16 because it just wouldn't look great on a big screen, but... I'm telling you guys that moment I'm referring to when it goes from 35 to 16. I think that's probably one of the most brilliant ideas I've ever seen in a film. I just, I don't, I don't, I, I, and it's such a small moment that I don't think a lot of people are going to see. I didn't even pick up on it, but you'll know it. You'll feel it. Okay. All right. Keep keep going with our blend game. We're going to shift over to uh, hashtag Michelle Williams blend because she plays uh, Spielberg's mom, essentially, Mrs. Fableman in, in this one. Uh, you know, it's called the Fablemans. It's essentially the Spielberg uh, biography. Um, but Kev, where'd you go with Michelle Williams for Michelle Williams blend? I'm staying here. Are you? OK, I kind of thought so. So I'll tell you why, though, because and again, I'm not comparing my mother to Spielberg's mother. But when I watched a lot of the film, I saw my mom a lot in just the pure caring that she had for her son and mm. and the, his art. There's a moment where early on where and this is in the trailer where like I think uh, Sammy, young Sammy Spielberg uh, ends up getting that eight millimeter camera and he films that train crash and then he brings his mom into that like back area right to watch. Mm-hmm. And there's a look on her face in that sequence that reminded me of my mom so much. Just mm. this pure proud uh, element. Yes, Gabe. No, I was I was waiting for you to finish. Go ahead and finish. But I have a oh, no, note. I have a we have a we have a breaking breaking real okay. blend news just for real. All right, blend. Keep, all right, I'll keep this quick. Um, so long story no, no, short, no, no, take your time. When I watched that those scenes of Michelle Williams, I just thought about the relentless love that a mother has for their child, and to see a mom who's struggling with what she's struggling with in the film. I won't go into details, but if you know that Spielberg's history you know kind of what happened with his parents um there was a lot going on in that household she want you know she was an incredible musician um who kind of gave up that career to you know be with the family and that idea of struggling of like what she wanted to do and what she wanted to be but then seeing her son be the artist that he was going to be and then sitting there going like i view that moment when she's watching that that eight millimeter footage as like OK, this is what I gave up. This I gave up what I gave up because this was worth it. That makes sense. And mm-hmm. I think to me, she just captures that role and disappeared completely. And Michelle Williams has been around in this business for years. We've, we've been watching her for years and great movies. Everything from was it broke back to um, Manchester to uh, Blue Valentine, Manchester. She is an outstanding actor, but this particular role was the, to me, the best thing she's ever done. Um, I just felt that she was, it was a genuine performance that she actually cared about. And it meant so much to her to be involved in it. And you could just feel it seeping through the screen. The responsibility you have to have to play Spielberg's mother for Spielberg Hmm. is (laughs) a, a, a daunting task in itself. But then to also capture the relentless nature and love a mother has, to me, 
in the essence of all that tornado drama that was happening in that household is just incredible. She was able to be quiet with her son and love her son and understand what he was doing and his ability. And she was the supporter, right? In the film, she's the supporter. She believes in him. Um, and I just found that to be beautiful. And to me, I thought she just nailed it. And I just, even her dancing scene in the, in the forest, I just love every moment that she has in that film. She's a yeah. beautiful character. I she wanted to know before, before we get to the next pick, I think that is the first pick in the history of the blend game that is, coincides with the movie of the week. Oh, interesting. Like, I think it's the first time someone has picked the movie that the person is oh. in or made. I don't think we've ever done, because usually, not always, but sometimes we, it's often, hmm. We picked Michelle Williams because she's in the Fablemans this week. It seems recency, but it's really not. It's like, no, it, no, it's it, totally it, fair. It, no, no, I no, just no, figured that's no. a fun fact. Fun fact. No, you're 100% right. That. I don't think I thought about that. Um, yeah, I just go watch the trailer. If you have people who haven't seen the film yet, just watch her watch that eight millimeter film with him and mm -hmm. look at her face. That Jakey. to me is the performance of her career. Yeah, I'm Jake? also picking Fablemans. Oh, oh, what? Yeah, I love yeah. it. Yeah, and I, I, look, I, I, I tried to go back and look over her filmography and honestly try like like to Gabe's point I didn't want to pick the movie right. that was like the reason we were doing this mm. um I really wanted to find something different and every time I would go well maybe my week with Marilyn and I would go no nah, she's better in Fableman than she is in my week with Marilyn like she's great in all these other projects yeah but she she so fully realized and disappears mm. so entirely um in 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 this project and in this film and 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 yeah, a lot of it is is Kushner's and Spielberg's writing and a lot of it is Spielberg's direction and a lot of it is the heart and the trueness that comes from from Spielberg's heart. But a lot of it's her. A oh, lot yeah. of it is, uh, you know, it's it's you know, if if they all get her in the red zone, she takes it and, and brings it into the end zone like that. Mm -hmm. Like she what she does with it adds that extra dimension that, it's that's just not there it is it, it, it really feels special yeah I, I, as weird as it sounds her performance makes me feel like i know spielberg's mom or it makes Agreed. me feel like i i understand who she is and by extension who he is mm -hmm. and and that's that's her performance that's what she puts out on the screen um she within a matter of uh, almost three hours she like i loved her and she frustrated the hell out of me. Mm -hmm. And some moments I felt sorry for her. And some moments I was angry at her. Mm -hmm. And it all came from the same person. And I understood the reasoning for everything. Um, and that's not easy to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I agree with Jake on that because you go through a full character arc with this. Yeah. One. Like, like this is not just like a, his mom, like supporting him throughout yeah. the, the movie. It is. Yeah. It is a fully realized, fully 360 dramatic yeah. performance. It's not rose colored glasses at all. Like it's it's, it's, uh, yeah. it's uh, this is why I always hated this, but it is very much a warts and all yeah. look at, at who they were. You yeah. almost feel like you shouldn't be watching this yeah. when this you're watching is, it. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned the rose colored glasses thing, because I do think in going back through her filmography, she is not afraid to take roles that no. that make her look difficult you know mm. and so i debated for a long time uh manchester by the sea uh because of what she represents in that film and she doesn't get a lot of screen time but mm. but the the, the reality scene. of her of her presence and what it means to casey affleck is um is felt in every scene of that movie but i i ultimately went with blue valentine um where it's one of those like it, okay so i think an actor would kill to have, you know, one performance as good as that <laughs> on their resume. Yeah. And the fact that she has Brokeback Mountain and My Week with Marilyn and Manchester by the Sea and the Fablemans. And like, she's an incredible, incredible actress. Um, but Blue Valentine mm. in particular, uh, it's it's amazing to me how fully she disappears into the character and every essence of the movie star is not present. You know, like both her and Ryan Gosling arguably are two of the most famous and recognizable actors on the planet. Um, and the fact that they just disappear into these roles of, you know, people from blue collar towns who are working blue collar jobs, um, who are having issues uh, at family, uh, family life issues and, and ex-boyfriend issues. Um, and all of it comes crashing down on the two of them and how they handle it. Um, it's Derek C in France, and I thought Derek C in France 
he went on to do um, Place Beyond the Pines, didn't he? Did oh, he yeah. that as well, too? Which is a masterpiece. So that's more of a representation of that type of storytelling, right? Like people who are just from the Rust Belt kind of and are, are pushing through the difficulties of these lives. I thought it started with Blue Valentine and I thought um, both she and Ryan Gosling were completely mesmerizing and, and incredibly tragic. Uh, and it reminded me then I think we were all sort of sort of at that point figuring out like how wide was Michelle Williams's range, you know, because for a while she was the Dawson's Creek actress, right? Like who's going to break out from that? And Vanderbeek was going in one direction and Katie Holmes was going in one direction and nobody really knew quite what to make of Michelle Williams. Um, and it's, I think it's pretty remarkable that she has had the career that she has had because of smart choices, you know, of working with filmmakers and taking roles that are incredibly challenging to her. Uh, and, uh, and one of those to me is, is blue Valentine is the one that stands out. So, uh, I went that direction, Robert Madden for audience picks. He went with Manchester by the sea, John Palmer, Dino Paulo, and others said Shutter Island. Uh, mm. oof, that's a that's <laughs> dude. The scene when DiCaprio goes into the water. Yeah. Oh, it's pulls... all right. Oh my yeah. god. Uh, Carrie said the Greatest Showman, going in the opposite direction of Shutter Island. Uh, <laughs> James Dorkings went with me and Blue Valentine, and then Rosemary Seacamp says as Gwen Verdon. Gwen Verdon, Gwen Verdon in the Fosse Verdon series, which I did. Fosse Verdon. That's a, that's Gwen. That's a Gwen Verdon. I didn't see Fosse Verdon. I didn't know if it's any good. So um, thank you very much for participating this week. For next week, reach out on Twitter using Gabe. Explain this to us. We're playing hashtag winter movie blend. Yes, we've played summer movie blend. We've played autumn movie blend. And hey. now we're playing winter movie blend, which I think Jake really likes these because he's a seasonal movie watcher. Um, no real parameters. It's not holiday movie blend. We've played that before, but it can be a holiday movie. It doesn't have to be a cold movie. It could be a warm movie. It can be whatever. It's more in the winter season. What's a movie that comes to mind that you find yourself watching, whether as a tradition or, um, you just enjoy watching because, you know, maybe it's some movie set in an Island cause you, it's cold where you're at, or maybe it's always warm where you're at. And so you're watching something with snow in it to, to, to feel that. Um, right. It's just uh, in the winter season. What What's a movie, a favorite movie of yours around the winter season? I dig it. Hashtag. What was the, the breaking? Was that the breaking news about? Um, is that what you were going to say? Oh, about it, was, Kevin it, was, the... it was breaking real blend news, which was, oh, we've, got it. which was, uh, got it. it's a, it's a new record or something. I don't know. I have, I have some breaking real blend news from some texts that have come in that I cannot share. Well, let's yeah. round out the, the episode. Hell, we, can, we can discuss. <laughs> round, let's round out the episode, and then I'll share this. What I'll share what I know with you guys. Um, our next Sean's getting episode. Spielberg. <laughs> no, he's been listening. In. Not the case. Uh, it's going to be a monthly mailbag. So check your descriptions about where you can um, a sign up for the premium, or also send us uh, questions that you want us to answer. Specifically, the email realblend at smblend.com. In the meantime, follow us on social media. We are at Jake's Takes at Kevin McCarthy TV, at Sean underscore O'Connell, at Gabe Kovach, and at Real Blend is the one for the show. We'll be back uh, next week. We'll be back on Monday with a premium, and then we'll be back next week with a full-on episode. Uh, enjoy your weekend, everybody, and we'll talk to you and next week. To those who celebrate, happy Thanksgiving and hockey pads. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs>